Thank you so much. Uh, my topic is, are there teleological agents or structures in nature? Most scientists and philosophers believe that teleology in nature has been ruled out by the progress of science. Those who still accept teleology of nature are regarded as superstitious or, or conservative, as religious fundamentalists or as neo vitalists and so on. But we will see that this is not so easy. Very important philosophers, for example, believe that teleology of nature cannot in principle be ruled out, in principle. As for instance, Hans Jonas, Robert Spemann, Eva Maria Engels, Peter McLaughlin or Thomas Nagel, and uh, Michael Polony has uh, mentioned by somebody. Uh, first of all, uh, we should make a crucial difference uh, between agent teleology and structural teleology. Structural teleology is treated in the intelligent design movement, but not only, as we will see. <coughs> first of all, we are interested in agent teleology. If teleology is ruled out completely, what about human actions? Are we only genetically programmed machines and are our mental states nothing but an epiphenomenon of the firing, firing neurons in, in the brain. Some naturalists believe that this is the case. If so, it is hard to see what is going on in society. Everybody, <coughs> even the naturalist himself, presupposes that he and the other persons are real theological agents. Otherwise, it would, would make no sense to assess the actions of other persons from a moral viewpoint. All the time, we praise or dispraise the actions of other persons, and it is hard to see how our social life could work properly without mutual assessment of our actions, which must rely for this reason on teleological, teleological grounds. Human persons act freely according to motives which are nothing but goals. But you might object that this is only a matter of human beings and has nothing to do whatsoever with nature, which was the position of existentialists uh, like uh, Heidegger or Sartre. For them, human freedom was not rooted in nature, but it was an ontological exception. But in this case, a problem remains. Might it be possible that our ancestors, the primates, were only blind machines, while all of a sudden the faculty of teleology, uh, teleological agency emerged when humans came into being? Is there really a huge gap between us and our ancestors, or not rather a continuity? From this, it follows necessarily that not only we are teleological agents, but at least the primates too. But if so, why not the other mammals or perhaps all animals? If you own a cat or a dog, you all the time presuppose that your animal is a teleological agent. By, yes. <laughs> Do you have a cat? <laughs> but, that's true. Huh? By empathy, you are sure of this. The same holds for ethology, which means a behavioral science. Scientists in these fields have no problems to speak of their animals as teleological agents. And this is not only a façon de parler, as in the concept of teleonomy. I'm living in Zurich, in Switzerland. Very nice, by the way in Zurich in Switzerland, and I am friends with the famous ethologist Karl van Schaik. Perhaps you have seen him at the television or read his book, books. Uh, Karl van Schaik is a primate researcher since decades. I, I often speak with him. He all the time assures me that his primates are real teleological agents, and he doesn't notice that he contradicts Darwinism straight on. And this is often the case in science. They tell you that they are nothing but deeply convinced Darwinists, and all of a sudden they make use of such uh, teleology of nature. This is very, very strange, I think. This is all the case for ecological ethics. At least if you endorse a non-anthropocentric <coughs> position, 
which is more and more common in, in the scientific community. In this case, you believe that especially sentient beings have interests and exist for their own sake, and not only for our own well-being, if we want to eat them, for instance. Um, Kant speaks of uh, Selbstzwecklichkeit. I don't know how to, uh, to uh, translate this. I, don't, uh, I think it exists in, in English. It means that uh, uh, an animal exists for its own sake, something like that. Okay. In this case, you presuppose that at least sentient beings have goals of their own, which means that they are real teleological agents. And this might suffice for the moment. I could uh, tell you much more stories uh, uh, of teleological agency in nature, but uh, this might suffice for the moment. There is also much structural teleology in this world, which is completely independent from the intelligent design movement. I'm not a biologist, so I cannot, uh, I, I don't know if the arguments of intelligent design are valid or not, but I have. Mm -hmm. I have good reasons to believe in structural teleology in, na in nature. It occurs <coughs> everywhere. It emerges, it emerges if you take te technological artifacts as starting point in order to explain nature. This has been overlooked since the days of Descartes. Descartes thought of animals as machines which could be, which could be completely explained by physics alone. But it, this is not the case. To make sure machines work according to the laws of physics, which have no teleological meaning, but this is not the whole story. All machines, mechanical or computational or whatever, act according to goals for which the engineer has shaped them. So if you think of organisms as machines, you think of them as teleologically structures uh, 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 entities, and that's what we do all the time. For instance, in biocybernetics, in bioinformatics, or in bionics. Uh, so let's take, for instance, cybernetics. Since many decades, philosophers of science assure you that cybernetics is a means to abolish final causation. That's what they tell uh, since 15, 60 years. Everything in the cyber system works according to the laws of physics, which have no teleological meaning. So I can replace, that's what I tell you, so I can replace final causation by efficient causes. So for instance, the great philosopher of science, Wolfgang Stegmüller, who wrote uh, much books and uh, especially <coughs> books on teleology. Nobody denies that a cyber system relies on the laws of physics. But this is not the whole story. If you read, for instance, uh, the famous textbook on cybernetics of Ross Ashby, he tells you on the first page, even on the first page, that cyber system always presupposes a certain goal. Otherwise, it would not work. Now, if you apply cybernetics to nature, you see organisms in the light of structural teleology. You cannot do otherwise. This uh, follows necessarily. This was already the case in uh, Norbert Wiener's famous book, Communication and Control in Animals and Machines. By the way, I, I, uh, this title is very, very strange. Communication and control is not the same thing. And animals and machines are, are not the same thing either. But I, want to, I don't want to discuss uh, this problem now. I only, only want to show you that uh, cyber, uh, cyber, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, cybers uh, from the beginning looked at nature from the viewpoint of a machine. This was uh, uh, communication and control in animals and machines was uh, the, the uh, was the first book about cybernetics because uh, Norbert Wiener invented it in 1948. He was the first uh, to create this. So um, I cannot see how we could avoid uh, structural teleology of nature if we take as a starting point a technological artifacts and look at nature in the light of these artifacts. This is not the same thing as in physics. 
if you uh, explain something on the on the basis of uh, natural laws. <coughs> now another example, perhaps you uh, you noticed it. The other example is bionics. Bionics is, so to speak, the inverse of bio biotechnology. In biotechnology, as for instance in genetic engineering, we treat nature as pure matter. It is us who set the goals and nature must obey. But in bionics, it is the, the other way around. Nature works since about four billion years under the condition of extreme parsimony of resources which is a consequence of the survival of the fittest. Now, scientists have analyzed the degree of efficiency of organisms in nature and were very astonished that they are superior to our machines, much superior. It's, it's incredible. A jet plane has, for instance, a degree of efficiency of uh, about 15%, which is very, very low. While a sparrow, a simple sparrow, has a degree of 98%. This is, this is, this is incredible, huh? but it is the case. Glowworms emit cold light. We have not the slightest idea how this works, but in bionics we try to understand how nature is so incredibly efficient if you compare input and output. Now, if nature is the prototype according to which we construct our machines, and if our machines are teleologically shaped, nature must be structured also according to goals. Otherwise, it could not be the prototype. This doesn't work. Uh, you, you will, but you will see something very strange, and it's intriguing. Huh? The, the most important uh, bionic uh, Specialist in, in Germany is Werner Nachtigall. He wrote several books on these topics, and he is not aware of this problem of, uh, of teleology. It, it doesn't treat it. All the time he makes use of teleology, but he doesn't say it. it, it um, it's, it's just the same situation like in ethology. The title of one of the books from Nachtigall reads Lernen von der Natur, which means something like nature has something to say, and this can only be the case if nature wants to tell us something. This is totally new, I think. Because since uh, the time of Galileo, uh, they said, uh, Galileo said himself, the book of nature is written in mathematical letters. Before, uh, nature was something like a noble, where you can learn something. But this has been ruled out uh, since the days of uh, Galileo. And now, all of a sudden, in bionics, all of a new, uh, you, they tell you that nature wants to say us something. What does it mean, really? This is not philosophically uh, really uh, we don't know really ex exactly the meaning of what is going on here. I think this is a, a some th somehow a revolution since uh, 300 years. We thought of nature only as uh, um, materialistic, explainable uh, system uh, by the laws of physics. Now, all of a sudden, we think of nature as something that has been shaped, which has a meaning. And this is totally new. Okay. Now you will perhaps be reminded of Aristotle. This is man, one of the philosophers I like most. Everybody tells you that Aristotle this is ruled out. It is not the case. Aristotle uh, has, uh, has much to say in our uh, situation today. You will perhaps be reminded of Aristotle, for whom nature and technology were in the some respect identical, and in another respect, not at all. So, he uh, explains me why we have uh, in nature um, uh, organisms who are well constructed without being a, a machine. They are no <coughs> machines, but they resemble machines. There's an identity between nature and uh, technology, and there's a difference as well. That's what uh, Aristotle explains me. He says, this is Greek, which is often translated as technology and nature are identical from a structural viewpoint because 
they are both tele teleologically shaped. While they are different with respect to the principle of spontaneity, which comes in the case of technology from outside, from the engineer or the craftsman or something like that. While uh, in nature you have an, uh, uh, th this uh, spontaneity is an intrinsic property of, uh, of the organism, which uh, Aristotle calls entelechy. So Aristotle, entelechy means the goal is in the living being. It doesn't come from outside. It's not a, a technological device or something like that. So Aristotle is by no means outdated concerning teleology of nature. Now, you might perhaps ask, you might perhaps ask why there is so much teleology of nature in this world without being noticed. This is very strange. Uh, the reason, I think, is very simple. Today, many scientists and philosophers are reductionists and materialists. If you endorse materialism as a worldview, which, uh, which is very common, you must deny final causation, because in this case, uh, materialism is dead. You agree with David Hume, in this case you agree with David Hume that efficient causality is the whole story. It is, it, it is as David Hume says, the cement of the universe. The world holds together with causality, which means efficient causality and finality plays no role at all. In this case, uh, materialism would be true, but uh, if there is finality in nature, um, the, the materialism would be false. I, I, I al always think that if you, what I do, if I believe that uh, teleology of nature is something very important, it, it, it's, it's everywhere I can see that uh, uh, philosophers and uh, scientists make use of this, but I must remind you that this, this doesn't imply necessarily Christian religion. You cannot make the shift directly from teleology to theology, because if you deny materialism, you are not uh, Christian. This doesn't imply it, because there are other solutions as well, as uh, pantheism, for instance, uh, Schelling, Goethe, Hegel, they believed there is only a, a God in nature, not a transcendent God. So, if you want to make the shift from teleology to a Christian faith, you must have other arguments too. But at least it's, uh, it's very important to show that materialism is false. That's what I did all my life. This, this is why uh, I became a professor only in the age of uh, 53 or something like that because it's uncommon. Nobody wants uh, teleology. But uh, I don't bother. I'm not a biologist, so I don't know exactly what is going on in the intelligent design movement uh, with uh, irreducible complexity and such stuff. But one thing is clear. If there is really much teleology of nature in the world, as I do think, then intelligent design movement is not so exotic as it may uh, as it may seem at first glance, and this might help you. Oh, I'm too short, but this doesn't matter. <laughs>